Okay, everybody. Good morning, and thank you very much for joining me today for UVC Disinfection Technology in the Post-Coronavirus World. This is a AIA-accredited webinar. Uh, it's one LUHSW credit, and you will be awarded your credits uh, after the webinar. We'll send a uh, email out shortly afterwards with a short survey. Please, if you want the credits, include your AIA number in that, and we'll be sure to award you uh, your hard-earned, well-deserved credits. Uh, I am Dan Lippin, uh, the co-founder and president here at Pure Lighting Company, and my areas of expertise in the world of UVC include the theory and science behind it, as well as the controls. I am the software guy here and am um, half of the major force behind our uh, R&D uh, leadership department. My background is in electrical and computer engineering from Rutgers uh, University. I do come from a, a technical engineering based background. Uh, fortunately, I think that everyone on this webinar does as well. So I'm looking forward to diving into the weeds a little bit. Uh, though we'll be getting into some detail, this is a survey level course. If you're interested in diving into more depth on any of the topics we talk about, please include that in the survey as well, uh, because we are starting to create our schedule for the autumn of 2021 and the winter of 2022. As a firm, Pure Lighting Company is a engineer, design, and dealer of lighting systems, notably UVC disinfection, stage solutions, and LED upgrades. And for you architects on the call, uh, we do work uh, well with architects, and we do like the uh, technical challenges you present to us. So we are here to assist with design and specs, demos, mock-ups, project management, and of course, educating on new and emerging technologies, not just in UVC, but in lighting in general. And before we get into our topic, one last PSA here. This is part of our monthly AIA accredited webinar series. Next month, we're going to be diving into wireless lighting controls, applications, and design. If this is a place that you haven't dove into recently, there is a lot of very interesting new technologies emerging uh, due to the uh, emergence of Wi-Fi and uh, on deck with the emergence of 5G. And then in a couple months, we'll be doing stage and theater lighting systems for schools. So if you'd like to join in for any of those, please email us info at purelighting.com and we'll get you signed up. So today uh, we are going to be diving into UVC. I mentioned that this is a survey course. It is an introductory level course, but we will still be diving into a lot of topics nevertheless. Uh, we're going to go through a bit of a background on what UVC is and why we're talking about it. We're going to get to UVC demystified. Uh, I know that when we first uh, dove into, <laughs> dove, when we first uh, got hurtled into the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of questions and misconceptions about UVC technology. So we'll be addressing some of those uh, at the onset and we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about applications, different types of UVC technology, as well as different places and different spaces that they may go. And we'll end off with a interactive Q&A. At any point, if you have a question, please use the Q&A module that's built into Zoom. I will be answering them at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can ask them at any point though. All right, so let's get into some background here. So I like to start these conversations with a brief overview of UV technology. This is not a history class. We're not gonna go through every point. And by the way, sorry ahead of time, the uh, slides are a bit dense. I'll include a link for the slides uh, with the survey that's going to follow the webinar. So you can download them. Don't worry about reading into it too much. You could read into it uh, later. But I'd like to start with this slide because what's interesting here is this number right here, 1901. 1901, the first UV lamp was commercialized. 
1904, a Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to Niels Fensen, who was using uh, UVC light topically to go and eliminate the pathogens, the bacteria of a topical version of tuberculosis. And in 1910, the first major UV water treatment facility was used. This technology has been used for well over a hundred years. What that means is that we have not only the amount of research and testing and data, but we have multiple generations of that. That means we get to see over a long period of time what damage, what harm could it do, and what benefits can it do, and how can we maximize the benefits. And then there's one other uh, little number here, date here, and it's 1934, first modern fluorescent lamp developed. The reason why I mentioned that is that the technology inside our low pressure mercury UV uh, technology that we're using nowadays, that's most predominant, is essentially identical to the fluorescent lamp technology that all of you um, are know so dearly from the technology that we used as recently as five, 10 years ago and that we will still see in some facilities. We'll talk a little bit about the future of LED UVC uh, later on, but it's uh, not quite there where we want it to be yet. So UV light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It falls in the wavelength range of 10 to 400 nanometers. On the other side, 400 to 780 nanometers is the range of visible light. So UV light in of itself is invisible to our naked eye. There are some animals that can see it, but this is not a class in zoology, so we won't go into that. Uh, UV light is something that we're very familiar with because UV light comes from the sun. Uh, there are multiple subsects of UV light. UVA is something that we know very well. It's what gives us our sun tans. It's what we get at the Jersey Shore when we're sitting down enjoying uh, a few brewskis after a nice long week of work. 95% of the UV light that's naturally occurring on Earth is UVA light. UVB light accounts for about 5% of the UV light that naturally uh, is on Earth. Most of it is filtered by the ozone layer. UVB penetrates deeper into the skin and it can cause sunburns, it can cause cataracts, and UVB is the major proponent, uh, or let's say major purveyor of skin cancers and uh, sun exposure related cancers. UVC is completely blocked by the ozone layer, so it does not naturally occur on Earth. It has to be generated from specialty fixtures uh, that we go bring in inside of this layer of the ozone. Uh, so uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, flying up right now is getting a good dose of UVC, but once he gets back into the atmosphere, uh, he will be completely uh, free from that unless he uses a UVC lamp. UVC is what we're going to be talking about for the most part in this webinar because it has a natural germicidal, firicidal, and sporicidal effect. And then we have finally uh, UVV, UV, there's different names. This is something that can only exist in a vacuum, uh, completely used for theoretical um, or high-end physics work, so we can ignore that uh, for today's discussion. So. I remember when I was first learning about this, uh, the idea of light that was uh, pathogenetic seemed uh, a little crazy to me. It seemed like a, a science fiction uh, you know, type of uh, concept there. And the way that UV, uh, UVC treats uh, and disinfects is that because we have pathogens that have a very small profile, uh, pathogens as small as one, um, uh, let's say one cell, uh, to a small multi-cell organism. What happens is that UVC light can go and penetrate deeply enough through that cell wall into the RNA and DNA of that pathogen. Once it gets in, it causes a process called thiamine dimerization. And what that does is it brings two of these uh, nucleo nucleobases together, tears apart the DNA, and from that, no longer can that DNA replicate. So it doesn't actually kill the pathogen. It causes the pathogen not to be able to reproduce. And when we talk about infection, the most dangerous aspect of infection is going to be that reproduction of the pathogen inside of the body. So 
we'll talk a little bit more about the safety of UVC, but when we're talking about larger organisms where we have things like layers of skin and we aren't composed of just a few cells or a few hundred cells, uh, we don't have to worry so much about the danger related to UVC uh, because it's not going to be penetrating us nearly as deeply as a pathogen. And so one thing else to mention um, here as well is that because of this process, it doesn't discern between bacteria, viruses, uh, mold spores, or other pathogens. So it is truly a pathogenetic uh, solution, which is rare uh, without some very, very harsh chemicals or harsh processes. And UVC, the reason that we're talking about it is that if UVC was something that worked well, but was either prohibitively expensive, uh, too complicated to put into facilities, or uh, extremely dangerous, it wouldn't make sense. But fortunately, there are a wide array of benefits. This is something that we'll dive into as we go. Between its efficacy, you can get 99.99% or greater disinfection. You'll see six logs. Uh, that's going to be 99 with four with dot four nines after it uh, percentage uh, on a normal basis. It's just a matter of dosage. You have high levels of safety, uh, especially when you start to bring in properly engineered systems. It is facility friendly. There are many different ways for it to be applied, which we'll get into. Future ready. Again, this has been used and tested for more than 100 years. There is a ginormous slew of different pathogens that there is data showing that it can treat. And so far, whatever it has been tested on has worked and we have not seen UV resistant mutations. That is something that we have not seen um, in pathogens like we've seen in something like C. diff or MRSA where you have antibacterial based uh, pathogens that are reacting to some of those um, you know, uh, antibacterial uh, products that we're eating. Uh, versatility and budget consciousness, uh, it is a nice investment with a rapid ROI. All right, let's get into some of these demystifications, some of the commonly, um, some common misconceptions with that. Okay. So first off, does UVC work with SARS-CoV-2? We are still, unfortunately, in a pandemic. Unfortunately, we are seeing rises of cases due to the Delta variant uh, here in the States and across the world. So this is still a conversation that we need to have. Um, hopefully, it's not a conversation we have to have much longer. But unfortunately, all signs are pointing to uh, COVID-19 lasting for quite a considerable amount of time yet, even with vaccinations and um, some of the other protocols we have in place. So then the question becomes, does this work against SARS-CoV-2? As a firm, we are very adamant in terms of having research-backed solutions. So here we have a small selection of research proving with a resounding yes, this works against SARS-CoV-2. We have different organizations here. And not only does it work against SARS-CoV-2, but the dosage required to treat SARS-CoV-2 with UVC light is very small. SARS-CoV-2 is incredibly susceptible to UVC light, which allows some systems such as air purification, UVC-based air purification systems to thrive with this type of aerosolized uh, virus. So we have here, a study from Boston University and Signify, a major uh, player in creating some of the technologies, UVC technologies, showing 99, a two log uh, reduction at five millijoules per centimeter squared and a six log in 20 with 22 millijoules per centimeter squared. Uh, these are values that are easily able to be achieved uh, in a matter of uh, minutes, if not seconds, depending on the dosage. And as we go through the term dosage, uh, it's gonna be something that I'll use. When I talk about dose, uh, dose is a measure of two factors, light intensity and the duration of treatment. So as we know from our standard lighting, the closer you are to the light source, the more lumens a standard light will have, or in terms of UVC, the more UVC intensity you'll have. So a pathogen close to a light source is gonna be treated a lot quicker and more effectively than a 
uh, pathogen at a further distance over the same time. That said, time is also going to be a factor here as well. The longer a pathogen is under UV light, the better it's going to be treated, the more of a log reduction you will be able to achieve. So dose, again, is going to be intensity times time. And we talked about SARS-CoV-2, but there is a large amount of other viruses, bacteria, molds, and pathogens at the streets. Here's just a selection. And when we're talking about improving indoor air quality, and we're talking about reducing the amount of pathogens in the space, especially airborne pathogens, uh, which are the most contagious, we want a solution that's going to be future ready. UVC is going to provide that level of active disinfection for this pandemic, for future epidemics, and hopefully we don't have to say knock on wood, future pandemics as well. And then in terms of here, the next question that comes up is this regarding the safety of UVC light. So with UVC, uh, it is worth describing some of the you know, safety and health-based considerations we need to be aware of. When we're talking about direct exposure from UVC light, uh, OSHA has provided a guidance of six millijoules per centimeter squared over an eight hour period of safe direct human exposure to 254 nanometer UVC light. We'll talk about the wavelengths, what 254 nanometer means a little bit later on. After that, there are a few uh, dangers that can come. Fortunately with UVC light, because it cannot penetrate deeply into either the skin or the eyes, everything that is associated with it is going to be temporary. Uh, you'll have full recovery in 48 hours max, usually under 24 hours. So long-term skin exposure is going to cause some reddening and some uh, irritation to the skin. Long-term eye exposure is going to result in a condition called photokeratitis. This is uh, also known as Welder's flash or snow blindness. This is what happens if you stare directly at the sun, a irritation of the eye. But looking at the graphics here, you do see that these wavelengths of UVC, 222, 254, don't penetrate deeply into the uh, skin. It stops in the epidermis, which is going to be layers of dead skin cells. And in terms of the eyes, it's not going to pass beyond this protective layer that we have um, in front of the eye. And when we're talking about UV light in general, UVC is actually not known to be carcinogenic because it cannot penetrate into things like the basal layer where new skin cells are generated. What we do find or what researchers have found is that it's UVB and UVA, which do penetrate deeply into the skin and eye, which is carcinogenic. So UVC all the same, we'll talk about for whole room systems, for direct application systems, avoiding direct human contact or direct contact with uh, any animal, uh, but there is, a, let's say a safety buffer that's built in uh, before any damage happens. I know when we first started with UVC, people were uh, scared that if they looked at UVC that they would uh, erupt in flames or something graphic like that. Uh, fortunately, uh, that, is not, that is not the case. Uh, very fortunately, that's not the case. And in terms of protection, protection is simple with UVC. Um, long sleeves, uh, a collar that's up to protect the back of the neck, a nice sun hat, pretty much whatever you would do if you had fair skin like I do under the you know, intense sun when you have a high UV rating, that's going to apply. Also, UVC cannot penetrate through uh, opaque and solid substances unless they are specially designed for that application. So wearing uh, glasses, whether it's sunglasses, normal glasses, or like this picture here, special uh, UV blocking glasses will protect the eyes um, or standing behind a pane of glass, a pane of plastic or some material. When we're talking about things like air UV based air purification, whether it's in an HVAC system or a standalone unit, since no light is escaping the metal confines, there is no danger at all associated with uh, anyone in the area. And when we're talking also about high quality UVC material. There's no byproducts that are emitted. 
Um, anything under 240 nanometers, again, we'll talk about that later on, can produce ozone as a byproduct. This is especially noticeable under 200 nanometers. If you go onto amazon.com, you type in UVC lamp, you're gonna find very cheeky marketing that says dual use ozone and UVC. That is a cheap lamp that they're trying to market and bolster. Ozone is great for disinfection, but ozone's also terrible for our respiratory system and needs at least two hours to clear out of a room, depending on the level of uh, ventilation in that room before it's safe for occupancy. The systems that we're gonna be talking about today are based on the idea that they are safe for direct occupancy, either when they're used or directly immediately after usage. All right, and I won't go too far into this, but when we talk about UVC and the dangers associated there, we need to also compare this against some of the other common uh, means of disinfection. And one of those common means of disinfection that has been recommended across the board since the pandemic started is a usage and reliance on chemical disinfectants. These are harsh chemical agents. And since March of 2020, when the pandemic started uh, here in the States, there has been a, up to a 60-60% uptick in calls to poison control centers. And this has not been from accidental ingestion of chemicals, but rather from the vapors and fumes associated with them. So we do want to find systems that are going to be safe and that are going to limit some of uh, our reliances on some more harsh agents. One thing that is interesting with UVC is a new study that came out of the University of Waterloo up in Canada uh, showing that UV light can neutralize some of those harsh uh, chemical fumes. So quote straight from there, over 400 common disinfectants currently in use could be made safer for people and the environment and could better fight the COVID-19 virus with the simple application of UVC light. So this is showing after a chemical treatment, direct application of UV light can neutralize those harsh fumes and vapors. So UV light can play nice with some other means uh, as well. Uh, and if this is something that a client is asking about, you know, hey, do I only have to use UV light? Are there other applications? Um, again, you can use a combination. And honestly, it's something uh, when we're talking about pandemic times uh, that regardless of what option is went by uh, clients, there will have to be some sort of combination approach. All right, and also I point out this graphic right here uh, because uh, even as for our firm, we've applied this in schools, we've applied this in nursing offices, we've applied them in hospitals and patient rooms um, and it's been safe and received uh, with a lot of enthusiasm by users and clients. All right, so in terms of the investment of UVC light, uh, there is a rapid ROI of, associated with most UV systems. Of course, the pricing of UV can be quite um, across the board based on the quality. Uh, so based on the quality the certifications, uh, controls and safety features, uh, et cetera. So, all the same when we're talking about a system that is a higher quality system, uh, we can see a rapid ROI. This is something I know that clients are going to be interested in to make sure that this is something that makes sense as an investment, a long-term investment because it is going to be a capital project uh, or baked into a new construction. So something, this is a uh, case study that we put together for a project that we did here. Uh, chemical disinfection for a 900 square foot uh, open office area at about five cents per square foot by a independent contractor. Uh, this value was drawn from around 15 price quotes. So it was an average, uh, actually a low average value from those. Um, over a 260 day working year comes out to be just shy of 1200. A UVC hybrid system um, is going to come out including installation, utilities, um, commissioning, et cetera, just shy of $4,000. So it's going to be a four month payback period. That's going to be just shy of $8,000 estimated savings. And this value is actually in real life drawn from a middle school that we did. Um, and we found that, that after the first year, the school saved about 
three hundred and ten thousand dollars. Um, and then the savings only go up from there because they don't have to have that initial installation cost. So again, smart systems that are going to improve the quality of a space and then also provide a smart investment so it isn't priced out um, you know, for the client. Okay, now, now that we got through that, let's go through the uh, more interesting side. Gonna take a, a long sip um, of coffee right here to give us a, a little breather. I know that the topic is uh, a little bit dense thus far. Hopefully you're all still with me. Hopefully this is uh, interesting thus far, uh, but let's continue diving in a little bit more. So UVC, one of the things about UVC that needs to be well understood is that it should not be treated as a commodity. UVC, just like you put in a normal lighting system into a space, like you put in an HVAC system into a space with intelligence with engineering considerations with proper measurements as should UVC. There's going to be multiple factors to consider here. First is what's the goal here of the UVC? Is it to disinfect surfaces as well as the air or only air? Is this going to be my primary or supplementary means of disinfection? Is this something that uh, you know, our facilities team wants to use in conjunction with a heavy use of uh, chemical cleaners like we saw before to neutralize the harm? Or is this something that's going to be the main use and there'll be some other technologies or means to help supplement? And then finally, what's, uh, what's preferred here? A direct treatment that can only be performed in empty spaces or a less effective indirect treatment, but something that can be used while spaces are occupied. Uh, we'll be finding towards the end options where we can achieve both, but depending on the budget and the client need, it might be one or the other. And in the same side, when implementing a system, there are going to be factors that have to be considered. If we're talking about a whole room system where we have direct application of UV light, room dimension, reflectance of walls, ceiling, floor, and materials. Though UVC light is mostly absorbed, there still is a degree of reflectance. What's the furniture layout? When we're talking about things like a uh, in-duct system, what is, does the airflow look like? What's the usage and purpose of the space? What's the schedule of operation? What are the demands? If this is a school, for example, that has a turnover every hour of the people inside the facility, what we find is oftentimes they want a means to, uh, as close as possible, sterilize the room between different cohorts of students. Or is this a space where, let's say it's a single office where there's only one occupant inside that space all day, no new novel pathogens are entering, so one cleaning late at night might be sufficient. What, you know, we have to look in what and how is the space being used. In terms of the technology with UVC, uh, there's going to be different types of lamp technology. The most common uh, one that you'll see is low pressure mercury. Uh, this is going to be the standard. This is almost identical to fluorescent technology. There's also some uh, high pressure mercury systems for very uh, specific applications. The nice thing about uh, low pressure mercury is going to be that it has at this point, uh, the highest level of efficacy, let's say watt per intensity efficacy, uh, longest lifespan, and it's the most cost friendly. It does contain a trace amount of mercury, just like fluorescent technology did. So in the case that there is um, a break of the lamp, it does need to be uh, removed and cleaned properly. There's excimer technology. This is similar to the technology you saw in metal halide lights. The one thing that's different is that this is an instant on technology. It does not take the 10 minutes for the gym lights to slowly turn on. Excimer lamps, uh, one of the benefits is that it is the primary technology that allows for 222 FAR UVC technology. We'll talk about that, I believe, in the next slide which is an emerging technology with a lot of potential for safe whole room disinfection while spaces are occupied. Problem with uh, eczema technology right now is that's more expensive. The uh, lamp life is significantly lower. We're talking about 
two to 3,000 hours compared to anywhere between 8,000 to 16,000 hours for low pressure mercury systems. And then also eczema technology does have to deal with uh, overheating. And so most eczema lights have to be toggled on off to allow for adequate uh, cool time. And finally, UV, uh, LED. So UVC LED does exist, but at this point, it's not quite where it needs to be. I don't know how many of you um, were active during the, let's say, onset of LED uh, for standard lighting. Uh, what you found at that point was, uh, you know, four foot T8 lamps that were going anywhere between 60 to $120 per lamp. Nowadays, you can get the equivalent for, uh, you know, anywhere between five to $10 per lamp. So at this point, UVC LED is probably expensive and the efficacy is not great. They, there is a challenge in terms of getting enough uh, UV intensity to make that price point make sense. One of the reasons why, by the way, the price point is so high is that a lot of LED UVC technology relies on gold as a conductor uh, inside of the actual LED chip. So the materials are very expensive. And then with the common low pressure mercury, uh, just some considerations. Uh, this is fluorescent technology ballots are required. Um, and then also the efficacy of the lamp lowers over time. So uh, that does need to be considered with the duration of treatments uh, as we talked about dose. That's why having a system if there's uh, a whole room disinfection to have some sort of easy control system. Uh, we can talk about that later. If you're interested, we'll talk about that in great depth in our next webinar next month. Uh, that can, anyway, this control system that can easily change the duration of treatments will be important there. And wavelengths. So again, I know if, if, you're, um, if you've been reading up on UVC, a lot of this is old hat. If you are a little bit newer to UVC, this might be a lot of terminology thrown your way. Again, we'll provide you the slides as a follow-up, and we are available to answer any questions. We are very keen on nerding out. Uh, so if you just want to call and chat and ask questions, we are very happy to do so. Anyway, wavelengths. I mentioned uh, right at the beginning here that UVC is part of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. That in that spectrum, we have wavelengths um, from about 10 to 400 nanometers. Inside of that range, different wavelengths are going to have different efficacies and effects. So right now, 254 nanometers is the wavelength that can be readily achieved by the low pressure mercury system. At 260 to 280 nanometers, this has been researched back to show the most efficacy of UV uh, intensity, let's say pathogenetic UV intensity. So at 254, it's getting as close as possible to that range. With LED technology, we'll be able to maintain at that peak efficacy around 265 nanometers. Um, but again, we're not quite there yet. The, uh, trade-off between what we can get from LED versus the low pressure mercury just doesn't lean in the way of LED quite yet. Uh, my guess is we're about three to five years uh, away from having that make sense. At 185 nanometers, 180, anything under 200, uh, 240 nanometers, but especially under 200, ozone is generated. I mentioned that before. Unless that is something you specifically require or desire, I highly uh, recommend against it, again, because ozone is going to be toxic for the lungs. 222 nanometers, far UVC. If you Google search uh, UVC disinfection, you're going to see a lot of articles, research journal entries uh, relating to this. There's been some really beautiful work at Columbia University, a, great a few great publications through uh, the Nature Journal uh, that go into this. The idea of 222 nanometers is that at that wavelength, the light cannot penetrate through any layer of the skin or through any layer of the eyes. That is going to mean that a human can be underneath 222 light at any intensity for any length of time. 
and some of the research has tested on really, really high dosages at really long lengths. With 222, it's going to have um, still a high level of efficacy in terms of disinfection. It won't have such a high level as 254, but because it's safe for uh, you know, use while space are occupied, it can have longer treatment times. So 222 holds a great deal of promise, but right now we run into the risk of, or not risk, the problem of eczema technology is essentially the exclusive way to generate this wavelength. Uh, and as mentioned, eczema is expensive. Uh, the efficacy is not, uh, not great. It can be better. It deals with overheating problems and the lamp lifespan is low. So it's something on the, um, the docket. And if you dive into two, uh, UVC disinfection, you'll definitely be hearing about this wavelength uh, for certain applications, things like elevators, break rooms, uh, this can be a really great technology to implement. And finally, one last technology to talk about. Uh, we'll be diving into this technology more in a future webinar, which we'll be doing in the autumn, related to technologies to improve indoor air quality. This is 405 nanometers. This is actually not UVC, tech, UVC anymore. This is visible light. This is going to be a violet light. And at this wavelength, there is a slight germicidal and viricidal effect. Now, it's very slight. It's going to be uh, like a, a hundredth or a thousandth of what UVC can do. But this light is completely 100% safe to be under for any period of time. And since LED technology can utilize this light, it can also be implemented in existing lighting um, LED boards to go and provide a solution where you have white light with a little bit of this 405 nanometer being emitted from it. No one will be able to see that violet light, so it's not going to be ugly or strange light emitted, but there's going to be a germicidal effect that over a long period of time is going to eliminate or at least greatly reduce the amount of pathogens inside of a space. So this is a great technology to consider when looking at something like a uh, brand new lighting renovation or upgrade, or it's a great technology to look at when considering the uh, lighting inside of a space and implementing just a little bit of 405 into the standard uh, lighting. Uh, so there can be, again, that improvement of indoor air quality. Uh, and then finally, last pitch, we'll be talking about that in a few months uh, in greater detail. Okay, so let's get into some of the different types of UV technologies. So this is going to be whole room uh, or direct UVC treatment. UV, a direct UVC treatment, the idea there is shining a light onto a surface. Um, Anything that the light touches is going to be treated. So it's going to include the air that it passes through, as well as the surfaces that uh, directly get in contact with the light. These can be installed as in-ceiling fixtures. So uh, you see here a two by four troffer that was installed in a science classroom at a local university. Uh, the nice thing with systems like this is that it provides let's say the greatest level of efficacy. Uh, as a rule of thumb, the closer to source, the, uh, the closer to the end source that the source of UV light can emanate from, the greater the efficacy. So you can get a high level of efficacy with a system like this compared to, let's say, an indirect air purifier. Again, surfaces and air. And because there's natural air flow inside of a room, you're going to get a very large amount of the air treated. Uh, air treatment is going to be highly important because a, let's say the most contagious uh, pathogens are airborne, but we do have bacteria that can survive on surfaces for uh, up to weeks that do need to be treated as well. With a system like this, built-in safety features are going to be critically important. One of the standard features that needs to be included with any whole room system is going to be uh, inverse logic uh, motion sensors. 
So this means that if a UVC treatment is active, if someone walks into a space, it turns the fixtures off. Um, there's also going to be some other functionality that's important, such as scheduling functionality and some safeguards to make sure that this cannot be turned on while people are inside of a space. Yes, a little bit of exposure to UVC light is going to do no harm, but since we're talking about public spaces, whether it's an office or a school or a hospital, we want to ensure the confidence of residents or occupants is high. So on that side, um, you know, as a firm and as a recommendation, we are against any exposure to direct UVC light at any time. On the same side, uh, we talked in the previous slide with uh, in, in ceiling or ceiling mounted or wall mounted fixtures. This is going to be an example of a portable option. So same idea, we have high powered portable options. The picture here is a 650 watt unit that can go and disinfect a gym in, uh, if you look at the bomb picture here, that gym can be disinfected 99.99% in a matter of 20 minutes. Uh, so this is going to be a good option for spaces that are large and open or for more budget conscious shoppers. Uh, it's something that you'll see on the market a good amount. All the same since it is a whole room system. If you look at this fixture uh, specifically, at the top you see some of these little nozzles up there. Those are th motion sensors. So you have 360 degree motion sensing there to deactivate a fixture when motion is sensed. Again, safety is going to be key to make sure that this system uh, works, uh, works well and people feel comfortable with it. One more thing that I should mention in terms of a system like this, we see it here has a picture in the classroom. The idea here is that between uh, classes or late at night, a comprehensive disinfection is provided. But this technology can be implemented in places like bathrooms where you can provide automated between use disinfection. So someone enters the bathroom, fixtures remain off. And then when they leave the bathroom, there's an automated treatment to go and make sure that some of these high danger, high pathogen areas are automatically disinfected. That's going to be one of the major benefits of UVC light, especially using modern lighting controls to provide automated hands-free solutions to at least, at the very least, provide a high level of initial disinfection, if not a, a near sterilization level. All right. And then the last option when we talk about um, direct UVC is going to be portable options. Now you see a whole wide array of photos here. Um, some of these were taken from amazon.com, which um, is probably the most terrifying place uh, online or the most terrifying marketplace in relation to UV technology because it is the Wild West. There are claims that are astronomical and out of this world. At best, a, a lot of the technologies there are highly inefficient and don't work as well as they are promised. At worst, they are emitting ozone or are producing some safety measures um, that are uh, providing direct skin-to-skin -skin, uh, or a source-to-skin UV contact. There are great options, though, on the market, uh, maybe not Amazon or maybe deep in Amazon, I haven't checked in a little bit of time, that can provide spot cleaning. Uh, we've seen uh, first responders use this to go and treat uh, their N95 masks or some of their equipment. We've seen this used in schools to treat um, some common used objects like uh, basketballs or sports equipment. Um, and we've seen it in many different places. Um, it is something that we've seen a lot of clients do enjoy, uh, but it would have to be very much a supplementary uh, usage. One thing too is the the wattage, or let's say the UVC intensity would have to be high enough to be able to treat uh, and disinfect on a rapid basis. The nice part though is since these can be held very close to source, you can get a high intensity which will diminish the treatment time. Okay, next up, we don't have too, too many more of these and then we'll, we're right on cue for about 10 minutes of Q&A. 
So next up, and this is probably a technology that you may be familiar with for quite a while. This is a technology that's been uh, around for a while. Uh, if not, this is probably a technology that you've been hearing about recently. A lot of the major uh, lighting companies that are getting involved with UVC now uh, are really pushing their upper air UV systems. And the idea of an upper air system is that it's going to be either a wall mounted or ceiling mounted fixture that shoots high intensity UV light up at an angle towards the upper quarter, upper fifth, maybe upper third uh, of a space shooting up towards the ceiling. The idea there is that natural air currents are going to provide the contaminated air to move up, get treated by this high intensity light, and then pass it back down, this uh, treated air back to the ground. As we know, the air that we breathe out is going to be warmer than the air around us. Heat rises, so those contaminants move on up. Uh, this is going to be a nice solution uh, in the sense that it is going to be safe when properly administered. Um, it is something that can be used in a space while people are, are occupying the space. The one caveat here is that the fixture has to be mounted high enough that there isn't going to be direct, um, a direct line of sight from the, the lamp inside the fixture to the person that's occupying the space. Also on that side, the light shouldn't be low enough that someone can go and raise their hand and be directly impacted by the light. Uh, so though you'll see recommended out there seven feet, uh, personally, what we've seen uh, on the field and on sites is a recommendation for uh, mounting no lower than nine feet and to mount for ceilings that are at least 12 feet high. Uh, so on that side, this is a fantastic option for places with very high ceilings. We're talking about atriums, uh, those beautiful lobbies inside corporate offices. This can be used in gyms, cafeterias, again, places that are wide open, high ceilings, and with ceilings where you, uh, you want to have a little bit more of a passive type of look because these can be wall mounted or uh, uh, suspended in a way that there isn't going to be a very... Um, aesthetically damaging type of appearance. And then next up, uh, we can use a UVC inside of our HVAC systems as well. This is going to, again, provide passive disinfection, something that's safe for usage while people are occupying a space. And there are many, 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 many different ways that UVC can disinfect inside a HVAC system. It can be placed inside of the air handling unit to not only disinfect the air passing through, but disinfect the coils against the biofilm that naturally develops. It can be placed in ducts to go and uh, clean the air that's passing through. Uh, we even have a picture here of it placed inside of a unit ventilator. Um, so this is going to provide disinfection local to uh, this was inside of a classroom. With UVC, uh, HVAC, this is something that is going to be a uh, wonderful solution for any new HVAC system for a new construction. Uh, it's not a very expensive solution. It's going to provide a lot of benefit. The one thing with HVAC, UVC as a primary source of disinfection is actually I should say two things. One, it has to be properly implemented and not every system is going to be able to provide that two to six log reduction of pathogens. If, it's, if this is inside the duct, you need usually around 10 feet of straight duct space. Uh, the idea there is that again, UV, uh, the dose is intensity times time. When you have air passing through ductwork at a very rapid rate, you don't have a lot of time to treat. So you need a high level of intensity. And so usually what you'll see is something like this uh, gate system, a few of these gate systems. So there can be a large exposure time uh, or exposure window to that air that's passing through quickly. Same, same idea inside an air handling unit, though there can be very high intensity UV light, the air passes through quickly. So there can be uh, a lack of efficacy. Now, the next thing with a UVC HVAC system as a primary means of disinfection, or let's say a sole means of disinfection, is that there still will be some cross contamination inside of an individual room before the air is picked up by the um, return of, you know, air duct. 
So having something that's a little bit more local can provide a great solution to provide some more active disinfection. But again, we talked about UVC as either a primary means of disinfection or a supplementary means, either as direct or indirect. For an indirect supplementary means, UVC HVAC is a great option uh, as a price point for existing systems. It's not too high, and there are many adaptions that can be used uh, to go and incorporate at least some level of protection into existing systems. And again, for new systems, um, they are very simple uh, implementations to put in. All right. And then on a similar side, uh, if the HVAC is not an option, if, if passive air purification is demanded or desired, then there is UVC-based air purification, whether in ceiling or standalone units. Now, the one thing with UVC HVAC or UVC uh, air purification is that it is going to be a passive system. The air that's passed through is going to be treated, built in fans, it's going to pull air in, but this is going to mean that there has to be a proper placement of these devices to allow for proper airflow. On the same side, nothing is emitted from these fixtures and devices, meaning that there's no dangerous chemicals or contaminants moving into the airstream. Uh, some of the technologies that are on the market, though they promise uh, to go and, let's say, actively disinfect the space through some sort of technology, a lot of research is coming out showing some uh, not-so-savory results. So uh, we like uh, the fact that UVC, again, is going to be a fully contained unit. Uh, on the side, too, uh, there are some units that are going to combine MERV or HEPA filtration. A great option, we've seen the CDC uh, and EPA recommend the implementation of that type of filtration. Um, those do need to be replaced uh, anywhere between four and 12 months based on manufacturer instructions. There's also going to be some uh, magnetic and electronic filters that only need to be cleaned on a semi-regular basis. So a lot of different options on the market. This is a simple option. Uh, that's a nice, let's say, supplement uh, yeah, a nice supplement that can be used in conjunction with. And finally, last, uh, but definitely not least, it's going to be a hybrid solution. And the idea of a hybrid solution is to provide a solution that's going to allow for both air purification inside of a space and whole room disinfection. Now there can be, let's say, indirect hybrid solutions of incorporating UVC inside of ductwork as well as whole room fixtures. Uh, or there can be, if the ductwork uh, or HVAC system isn't an option for whatever reason, single standalone units that do both. While the space is occupied, purify the air, uh, and then while the space is unoccupied, provide direct whole room disinfection. Units like this will activate the air purification whenever the lights are on. That's usually a good indication that someone's inside of a space and provide whole room disinfection uh, when a space is vacated, either whether it's on a schedule, on a sensor for occupancy or vacancy, um, or different ways of doing so. All the same controls that went into the whole room would need to be provided into this to make sure that the whole room system operates safely. Uh, this is something that we've seen take off um, in recent months. Uh, and you'll see even here a uh, photo of the system inside of a vacate, the system on inside of a vacated patient room at a hospital. All right, so a lot has been covered. Uh, for better or worse, a lot more can be dove into, uh, which will save you from uh, right now. If there's any other, again, topics that you'd like to dive in in the future, uh, let us know in the uh, you know, the survey that we sent after this, but we have about uh, six to 10 minutes right now for Q and A. So if anyone has any questions that came up through the uh, webinar, uh, again, use that Q and A module. And I see that there's already a couple, let me just get a sip here. Great. All right, so the first question I have, um, relates to recommended applications. And to answer that, there's the nice thing with UVC is that it's incredibly versatile and flexible as we've seen all the different types of technologies that can be applied. Uh, 
With that, there can be many different applications. We've seen this applied in all different types of public facilities from schools, uh, law offices, fire departments, hospitals. Uh, I'm sure that there's many, many more that uh, aren't coming to mind, manufacturing, uh, et cetera, uh, and different applications for them. So with this technology, it is important to get a general idea of what a school or excuse me, of what a facility is looking for uh, and there can be a solution. Uh, one thing that as a firm we, you know, we do is we are here to help uh, with the specifications. So if you do have someone asking, uh, we are happy to help out on that side. In terms of the residential market, um, let's say indirect is a perfect opportunity. There are on the markets and direct solutions as well. Uh, but it is something because there's so many X factors inside of a home uh, that I think that when either 222 becomes a better option or 405 or using 405 systems, which are available uh, now, might be a better option than a 254 nanometer direct UVC uh, solution. All right. Yeah, so that question and that question. Perfect. Okay, so next question that I have here, and yeah, thank you for bringing this, uh, this up, is going to be in regards to uh, potential discoloration that can come from uh, UV light. So as we know, or as you may know, uh, even sunlight uh, can go and start to fade some colors and materials. Uh, if you this might be a hyper specific example, um, but if you have one of those old big boxy computer monitors right by a window, you may have noticed that a yellow tinge uh, starts to accumulate on it over a period of time. Same idea with UVC, there can be a discoloration. Fortunately, most new materials, whether it's a uh, flooring uh, covers, for uh, anything that's for walls, uh, paints, or even a lot of our furniture materials comes with a UV resistant coating. So long as there's a UV resistant coating, you're in fine shape. Um, and there can be, if need be, a uh, cover that buffers between the UV light and that end result. For us, the only place that we've seen discoloration be an issue is in schools inside the art classroom because a lot of the paints that students are using uh, do not have a natural UV filter on them. So in that case, usually the artwork is put behind a uh, just simple uh, blind, something along those lines, and it's going to inhibit the light. Remember, UV can't penetrate through essentially every solid object. There's uh, some very specifically designed glass to be used uh, that allows UV to come through, but vast majority isn't. So if a painting is framed or something like that, there won't be an issue. Yeah, uh, so one of the places we've also applied this exactly is churches. And there are some fixtures that exactly for the sanctuary. The sanctuary is actually a really interesting place because part of, you know, part and parcel of the sanctuary is the design and the aesthetic. I don't know how many of you have had the, uh, for me, I'm going to assume it's a, a privilege to work with a church or design church. Um, I've had the privilege to do the lighting for some churches. And it is such a, uh, an interesting process because the space has to evoke a certain feeling. It has to be beautiful. It has to be, um, you know, as a call out this almost sense of like, um, you know, godliness, right? And so we can't have some bulky, ugly, loud, disruptive technology there. So upper air UV can be very, very effective inside uh, of a church space. And we've actually seen that application done. Uh, well, we've, we've applied that, um, for multiple churches uh, with, um, with great success. So yeah, a church there. And again, guys, I know I've seen some uh, people I've seen in the chat uh, message come up. I think someone raised a hand. Just use that uh, Q&A module. If you look at your menu bar, uh, you'll see Q&A. Uh, just type in your question there, please. That's going to be the easiest way to, uh, for me to uh, I, you know, see them. All right. Uh, so I had this one from before. Uh, so next question I have is in terms of the aesthetic of the fixtures. 
uh, understanding that uh, you know there is a, a whole realm of architectural lighting uh, that is designed for efficacy to provide proper uh, lumens, dimming, color uh, controls, uh, as well as a form factor that's going to be pleasing to the eye and work in an unobtrusive way. So with UVC light, there, there's two factors. On the one side, let's say the limiting factor is that UV has to be directly exposed. Mentioned before, but uh, pretty much every opaque substance is going to block the light or cause the light to be absorbed. So there aren't like a frosted lens or something like that we can put on UV. So for maximum efficacy and to keep the price at a you know, reasonable place, we want the lamp to be directly exposed if we're talking about a whole room system. However, so long as the light is exposed, there are different ways the form factor can be built. It's something that we've had experience doing, creating custom uh, UV-based fixtures to fit in different um, criteria and in different form uh, factors. So it can be done. Some of the designs you saw in this are just standard designs uh, to get a general idea. But that's something that if there is a very specific need, uh, you know, let us know and we'll be happy to dive in and give you a, a two cents on that exact need. Great. Yeah. So in terms of tanning salons, um, so tanning salons do not use UVC. Uh, UVC is going to give you a very nice lobster-esque glow. Uh, I don't think that that's something people are into, but uh, then again, uh, I have, I've been too busy to, to go to the club or anything like that, so I don't know what the kids are doing nowadays. But in terms of tanning salons, that's going to be uh, mostly UVA and a small degree of UVB. Uh, I it's interesting that tanning salons are still around. Um, unfortunately, there has to be direct skin contact from that to, for the effect of the tanning to work. So in terms of making a safer tanning salon uh, from the technology of the light, I'm not sure how to do that. There might be uh, skin products that can go and reduce the amount of light um, or let's say maximize the uh, melanin absorption so a nice glow can, can come. But, um, Unfortunately, my opinion on tanning salons is that I think that they're doing a little bit more harm than good uh, on that side. Then again, you're talking to someone who's incredibly pale and burns under the sun, so I might not be the best for uh, giving advice on that technology. All right. Okay. And the last question that I have right now, and uh, again, feel free to ask any other ones, is, uh, is this technology... Uh, so pretty much about the controls. So with the controls, uh, it depends on the type of system you're using. Uh, if it's something like an HVAC-based system, uh, most are going to be BACnet compatible. So uh, they can interact directly with uh, your BMS system. And for the whole room systems, uh, there's a wide array of controls on the market. The controls that, as a firm, we uh, tend to specify and use uh, while they're standalone controls, uh, because they do need to do some things uniquely that regular lighting controls won't do. And also, we don't want uh, that same ease of turning on the system from anywhere on demand. Uh, so, for example, we don't want some facility uh, manager in a central office to turn on lights in a patient room in a hospital from, you know, miles away um, and, you know, have that patient under the direct light. So the controls do tend to be on their own, but they are, again, BACnet compatible. So the data from them can be exported into existing BMS systems uh, to provide daily comprehensive reports of what was on, when it was on, for how long it was on, what dosage was achieved. From that dosage, there can be simple calculations of what level of disinfection was achieved and all that information can be uh, simply gained from the controls that are inherent uh, inside of the whole room systems. All right, guys, so I think that's that. Uh, I really appreciate your time uh, through this. Uh, this is a slide that I do like to end these off with, is that, again, that term new normal has become uh, trite and cliche, but it really is uh, 
it really is true. And the pandemic has shined a light, um, no, no pun intended, on some of the uh, needs that need to be looked at when we're talking about high traffic facilities, notably indoor air quality. So even by participating here, by learning about this, by engaging, asking questions, um, you know, it is an indication that we're all uh, part of trying to find a solution um, and part of getting into um, this next phase in uh, building protocols. So I appreciate your time there. And once again, I'd love for you to join me for a future webinar. Um, email us. You can also, we'll provide this information, the links in the follow-up survey. We'll send it out in about an hour to two hours. So you'll get that shortly. Again, please open that up if you want the credits and provide us your AIA number if you haven't already, and we'll get those credits your way. Um, yeah, so we'll get you the, uh, the credits. We'll just automatically upload them to your AIA account unless you need a certificate. Um, we'll get those within 24 hours. All right. So long as you get us your number, um, we'll get you that survey in about, again, 60 to 120 minutes. So that said, that uh, ends us off today. Hopefully I'll see you again um, and really appreciate your time today. You'll hear from someone from our team shortly. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day and week. Be well.